Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship here at Ridgecrest today. I'm Chase. And I'm Lee. And we're so excited for what God is going to do here in the worship center on our campus, but also excited for whatever and how God is going to move wherever you are today. And we look forward with great anticipation, knowing and believing that God has a plan and a purpose for you and I to experience this service today. And as we begin, I also want to say this this morning, happy Mother's Day to all the moms that are watching and being a part of this service today. And happy Mother's Day to you. Lee, so thankful for you and just thankful for all of our moms. And really, it reminds me of this, the verse in the New Testament where Timothy is talked about his faithfulness because of the faithfulness of his mom and his grandmother. And so I know that's the story for many of us. It might not be the story for you, but at the end of the day, we can be thankful for God's hand at work in all the details when it comes to this Mother's Day. And you'll see later in our service today, our pastor will do a special recognition for all the moms as we think about you watching online or those that will be in our worship center. You know, as we think about what God is going to do today and how God is going to move, we say this all the time here, Lee, that God has given us a mission. Um, that's right. Our mission here at Ridgecrest is to reach the lost, build the believer, and connect the people of God to the mission and the purpose of God. You know, Lee, as we think of that mission, and it's an opportunity for us all to be a part of God's purpose and God's plan. And as we think about that, the way God ordained and orchestrated the church to be the church, it is to fulfill his calling and his mission. And so if you're a part of our church family today here at Ridgecrest, we want to say welcome to you. Thank you for being a part of this worship with us. We'd love to hear from you. Take a quick second to comment in the comment section. Let us know who you are. Let us know where you're watching from, something like that. And then comment back and forth. It's a way, as Lee mentioned, the word build. It's a way for us through the live stream to build one another up and to encourage one another, even if we're not in the same room together. Also this morning, we want to say welcome to our guest. Thank you all for worshiping with us and being a part of this worship service. And as you think about that, we'd love to hear from you as well. It's another place for them to comment in the comment section. And also they can text, you can text the word guest if you're a guest of ours, and that you can text the word guest to the number 334-384-8080. And Lee as well, there's another opportunity that people can do as they watch our live stream today. Um, that's right. We would also love for you to share this post on your social media pages for others to experience what God is doing here. Yeah, we look forward as they share. It gives us all the opportunity to reach more people. And so as you and I think about that today, we're talking specifically about reaching people with the service plan that God, through our staff, has planned for what we'll experience today. And, you know, Lee and I, we've had the opportunity to look at that plan, look at the songs, and there's a song that's going to be uh, led in this second service by Bradley and the team. That's a new song that we're really excited about, and we uh, look forward to how God is going to use it here in our church family, but specifically help us learn it today. Um, that's right. There, um, there's a new song this morning that we're going to sing called Promises by Maverick City Music. And um, it's all about the faithfulness of God and how great his faithfulness is to us. Um, I looked it up the other morning, and faithful means loyal and firm and unwavering. You know, the song talks about um, many scriptural truths, like how God's faithfulness and love never run out on us. And I just love that. Um, the song goes on to say, I put my hope in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. You know, we can trust him through whatever we're going through, um, the good, the bad, or the hard, and we can praise him in that, and that's a beautiful thing. That is such a beautiful thing, and this song is such a powerful anthem for us to understand and believe that our God is faithful and that our God can be trusted. And then as Lee has mentioned, in the good and in the bad and everywhere in between, he is, I love that lyric, he is the anchor that's firm and connected to the ground. Everything else in a lot of ways, Lee, as we think about it, can feel as if it's nowhere near connected to anything. And so Jesus is that anchor for us. And as we think about that song and the faithfulness of our God, it leads us to understand his faithfulness through his word as well. And our pastor today is continuing his sermon series that he started last week that's entitled 
Reignite to Serve God. And today is part two of that sermon series. And today's sermon is entitled Samuel's Sermon. So we want to encourage you to open your Bibles today to 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 19 through 25. Grab our pastor's outline and be ready for, to study God's word together with us. And again, expect God to speak and to move. Also, Lee, as we think about what God is doing here today at Ridgecrest, we want to talk about some things that are coming in the days ahead so that we can all mark our calendars. Um, That's right. First, VBS 2021 is coming up, and this year's theme is Destination Dig. VBS will be held June 14th through the 18th, and registration is open now. Register by going to rbcdothan.org forward slash VBS 2021. You know, Lee, our kids love VBS, and that's a highlight of the summer. And so we want to encourage you to get your kids or your grandkids signed up for VBS 2021. Also, we've already mentioned this a little bit, but during the month of May, we are doing what we're calling our Connect and Serve Emphasis. Lee, you have had the opportunity to serve in different capacities in the church. You just came from your connection group where there are many people that serve, whether that's your teachers or fellowship coordinators and different things like that. And it really takes many people to fulfill God's mission and purpose here at Ridgecrest. So we'd love for you to check this out this month and think about this booklet and look through the different opportunities and pray and ask God to help you say yes and serve somewhere here locally in our church that we call Ridgecrest. And as well, in just a few minutes, you'll see RBC3, and we want to encourage you to check that out and experience what God is doing. Uh, Lastly, we want to remind you about checking out all of our social media platforms, our podcast platforms, and our YouTube channel. Um, All of this is made to hopefully help you grow in your walk with the Lord. Yeah, and as you think about that, growing in our walk with the Lord, that's the opportunity that we have today. And so we want to encourage you to let that be your heart. Say, help me to grow today. You're about to see RBC three, three minutes again of details for you to know about our church. Then take the one minute countdown to prepare your hearts and ask God the question, God, will you speak to me today and move in a mighty way? Ridgecrest, I'm Teresa Cumbie. Stick with me for the next three minutes so I can tell you what is going on at our church and how you can get connected. This is RBC3. We're excited about our Love Your Neighborhood emphasis coming up Saturday morning, May 22nd. This is an opportunity for us to be the church in our own neighborhood. Love Your Neighborhood is a City of Dothan community cleanup program. We will meet with other volunteers from throughout the city at 8 a.m. at Selma Street Elementary School. From there, we will head out into the local neighborhood for a few cleanup projects. Ridgecrest will provide all the equipment, just bring yourself. This is a great way to share the love of Christ with our neighbors. To commit to the project, just text the word MISSION to 334-384-8080 or see Executive Pastor Chuck Locke. Many of you have already registered for Vacation Bible School. If you haven't already, now is a great time to sign your children for VBS, set for June 14th through the 18th. A registration desk is in our Welcome Center, or you can sign up online at rbcdothan.org. Plus, you can be a part of changing a child's life for eternity. We're always looking for VBS volunteers. If you can help, please see our Jessica Peterson. You are going to want to make plans for Sunday night, June 6th. We're bringing back our one family worship gathering at 5 p.m. Our choir and orchestra, along with our contemporary worship team, are coming together for an incredible night of worship. You will not want to miss it, and you will want to stay after for a meal and fellowship time in the fitness center. Finally, Ridgecrest, we had a great response last week from many of you who let us know you're interested in volunteering in one of our many ministries here. You have the same opportunity this week. 
There are inserts in your worship folder and displays with more information throughout our campus. Take advantage of those opportunities or you can always text the word SERVE to 334-384-8080 to let us know you want to connect through serving. So Ridgecrest, see Chuck Locke to get plugged in for Love Your Neighborhood on May 22nd or text the word MISSION to 334-384-8080. Sign up for Vacation Bible School near the Welcome Center and see Jessica Peterson to volunteer. Join us Sunday night, June 6th for one family worship and a fellowship meal after the service. And connect with us through serving in our various ministries. Now you're all caught up. I'm Teresa Cumby and you've been watching RBC3. All right, good morning. If you guys stand with us, let's worship together this morning. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over. Oh, my story's just begun And failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does No, failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does you thankful today for all that can happen in his presence come on let's sing this together arrival's not the end game arrival's not the end game the journey's where you are you never wanted perfect you just wanted my heart and the story isn't over if the story is Failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Come on now. No failure's never final when the Father's in the room. today. Prodigals come home, the helpless find home. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Yeah. Prison doors swing wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move.
Let's believe that this morning, that we're in the Father's house and His presence is in the room with us and we're going to experience Him today in a mighty way. We're going to worship Him in a few moments again through song. We're going to be challenged from His Word and we're so excited and thankful that you're here. Take a quick second, be seated if you will this morning. I want to say welcome to Ridgecrest. Welcome to all of you that are in the room. Also, welcome to those of you that are joining us online. We're just so thankful that you're here. And if you're a guest of ours this morning, we'd love for you to take a quick second and let us know that you're here. You can do two things. If you're in the room, you can take the Next Steps card that's on the back of your worship folder that you received on your way in. Fill that card out and drop in the offering baskets or take it to our Welcome Center, which is out this door and to the left or the back door and to the right. We have a gift bag for you if you come to our Welcome Center. I'd love to put a face with a name and give you that gift for you and your family or you personally. Or you can text the word guest. If you're online or anyone in the room as well, you can text the word guest to 334 384 80 and we'll receive that information and have some free digital resources for you as well. We'd love to make available. A couple things that I also want to make note of this morning um, before our pastor comes up and does a special presentation for Mother's Day. The first is this. We're in the middle of what we are calling our Connect and Serve Month. And there are brochures that look like this all around our church. We place them there hopefully that you could almost trip on them and find one and pick one up. Because what we want you to do is to take this brochure, or you can also see an insert in your worship folder this morning that lists all the different areas of service opportunity within our church. There are multiple more maybe that aren't listed, but there, this is a start. And we would love for you to pray through this month of May with us and say, God, where would you have me serve if you're not already serving? There's a place for you, and we believe that. You know, some studies show that what makes the mind up of someone that's visiting a church when they show up on campus, that thought is made up within the first five minutes or so that they walk on the whole campus from the start. What does that mean? Well, that means people that stand out front, people that hold a door, people that smile and shake hands or high five or do whatever we're doing these days, play a role. And so maybe that's just an idea for you to understand one of the many opportunities to serve on our welcome team. But we'd love for you to think about that and understand how all of that comes together for God's mission and purpose here at Ridgecrest of reaching, building, and connecting. One other thing that I want you to make note of is look in your worship folder today under the church-wide info. There's some details about something called Love Your Neighborhood and also VBS 2021. We don't want you to miss out. At this time, Pastor, if you'll come up and take this time to share about Mother's Day. All right. Well, congratulations to all of our moms. And I want to do something. I want to take, I was thinking about my own mom. Uh, she's been with the Lord for many years. She knew the Lord, loved the Lord. And I got to thinking about my last memory of my mom. And it was, um, she had a Datsun. And um, she would sit in the den. The last time I, I saw her when she was still alive, I'm sitting in the den. She says, watch this. And uh, so she would call the dog and she'd say, it's time for Bible reading. The dog would come flying in the room and jump up on the sofa next to her and she'd get her Bible out and she would do her daily Bible reading and read it to the dog. And the dog gets so excited about the Word of God because my mom had trained it. I believe that dog got saved. I believe she led it to cry. <laughs> But uh, I guess I could use that to say just, uh, again, what a joy it is to, to have those great memories of our mom, isn't it? Yes, and you do too, because they, moms are r really, you know, I'm going to be talking about service today in my message, but nobody exemplifies it better than a mom, amen. of what it means to serve, to serve behind the scenes. And, uh, you know, now my daughter is a mom uh, twice over, and uh, that's kind of cool to see that her mom, my wife, invested in her, and now she's invested. She's a good mom uh, to those two little boys, but it just keeps going, doesn't it? You know, our world we live in today wants to say there are no distinctions between anybody. Everybody's the same. You know, that's what the message of our culture is today, but it's not the message of the Word of God. 
the message of the Word of God is he made them male and female, and then he gave them responsibilities and roles. And one of those roles is a mama, to be a mom. And um, I'm sure you have great memories of your moms and, and your mom. I, mine, again, I always tell the Lord on this day, I don't know how this works, but I always ask the Lord on Mother's Day, would you go tell my mom for me how much I love her and thank <clears throat> how, much, how grateful I am for her investment in my life. Part of my responding to the ministry, she saw it before I did. And uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. And a mom who loved the Word of God enough to use it on her dog. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we have a lot of moms in this place today. And so moms, I want to ask you to stand up. Would you do that? Moms, stand up in this place. Let's give our moms a hand. Would you do that? Now, s remain standing, if you will. And I'm going to ask everybody else to join and stand up because we're going to have a word of prayer of gratitude for our moms and their investment. And I want to tell you about a couple of things. I don't know, did y'all see the photo booth out in the Welcome Center out by the coffee bar? If you haven't, you ought to go by and have your picture made today. It's a really cool thing, and it'll be sent to your phone. The picture will be sent to your phone Im immediately. And uh, you can go, it says, Happy Mother's Day, and they got balloons and all this kind of stuff. It's pretty cool. And so if you want to uh, remember this day uh, with that, stop by there. The other thing for all of our ladies, moms or no moms, it doesn't matter. We have a, I don't know what you call this. I call it a zippered utility pouch. I don't know. What would y'all call it, ladies? What would y'all call it? Uh, a utility pouch. They call it a makeup bag. That's probably what most ladies would call it. But it's got a great verse, Isaiah 43, 1, I have redeemed you, I have called you by my name, you are mine. And then a card for you to use as a marker or something in the back. And uh, we want you to have that as our gift today. All of our ladies in here, as you leave the building today, are, are, will be pa handing these out, passing these out. And so be sure you get one and take that with you. But feel free again to go down and have your picture taken. But uh, that's our gift to you, and we want you to have that. That's just a way of saying we love our moms and we're grateful for the investment that you have made in our lives. And so let's pray together and thank the Lord for moms. Father, we do thank you for our moms. Thank you for mine. And as I've said already, Father, however it works, would you tell her today for me, thank you. <clears throat> and Father, I pray that uh, all of us will take the opportunity today to express our thanks to our moms, our grandmoms, all of those things, Lord, to just say thank you for the quiet, uh, often sacrificial investment that you made of time and treasure and, uh, Father, to invest in us. Just may they know that today. We are so grateful, Father, that you ordained our moms and our life. And so, Father, we pray your blessing upon our mothers and we pray, uh, Father, that they will know today that they are loved and appreciated. And Lord, we pray that as we gather in this place and we're reminded of the, the example of our moms, we will be reminded of your sacrificial, sacrificial investment in our life by giving of yourself on the cross for our sins. Thank you for that. And we bless your name, Lord. May you be lifted up and exalted in this time as we continue to worship you we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's continue standing. Let's sing a song about the faithfulness of God together. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. Brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, or oh, my help in time of me. Lord, I can't help but sing. Come on, sing it with me. Come 
you thankful today that we serve a God who hasn't left us alone but he has made promises to his people and he is so faithful to keep them and you know what's difficult about that sometimes I think is that it's hard for us as people who go through things in life and maybe we have times of brokenness or hurt or pain and it's difficult to see how God is being faithful because maybe I'm hurting or maybe I'm broken right now about something that could be any number of things 
But just because I might be hurting or broken or walking through a valley doesn't mean that God is not faithful. His character does not change no matter what I may walk through. And he uses these things. Another way that he is faithful in our lives is to use these valleys to develop within us who he wants us to be. And I would just encourage you today that if you're in a place of of seeing God's faithfulness and you are on the mountaintop and you are thankful for it, then sing this new song with us at the top of your lungs. It's called Promises. And if you're in a valley, if you're in a place where you don't really see it, then the first line of the chorus of this song says, great is your faithfulness to me. You know, you can sing that from a place of, yeah, I believe it. I'm on a mountaintop with the Lord. I believe his faithfulness is great. I can see it at every turn. Or if you're in the valley today and it's difficult, I would just encourage you to say it anyway because that obedience of declaring to the Lord that you believe it, I believe your faithfulness is great no matter what I'm walking through. He will bless that. He really will. So wherever you're at today, whatever you're walking through, I just want to encourage you to sing this new song with us called Promises.
tell the Lord you love him this morning. Sing it out. And oh, I love him so. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for the truth of what we've just sung about. Great is your faithfulness. I pray that you would help us to see it, even in the times that we can. God, we love you and we thank you so much for your spirit being here with us in this place today. We know it is. That's another promise that you've made us. Where two or three are gathered in your name, there you will be in the midst of them. And so, Lord, we just know and believe the truth of your word today. We thank you for being here with us. I pray that you would open our hearts and our ears and our minds. Help us to receive your word. God, I pray for Brother Ray right now that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit. And God, that you would speak through him today a word that's exactly what you brought each and every one of us here to listen to this morning. God, we love you so much for this time together. And we thank you for what you're working in our hearts and in our lives. We pray that you would continue to be here with us in this place today. And it's in your name that we pray and ask these things. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Hey, I love what we just sang about and about how good God is. And y'all haven't preached in a while, so I'm going to give you a chance to preach for just a couple of moments uh, here this morning. I'm going to say a line. I want some of you to fill in the blank, all right? And the line goes like this. I know God is so good because he, fill in the blank, I know that God is so good to me because he, somebody, fill the blank in, because he, somebody, What's that? Bless you with he blessed me with a family, all right? I know that God is so good to me because he, somebody else. Only one, Robert. All right. <laughs> Let me turn this thing up. Uh, no, always provided, yeah. I know, I know God is so good because he's always provided. I tell you what, I bet there are a lot of testimonies about that in this room, right, where you have times where you thought, God, I need your provision, and yet he did it because he's promised to. I know God is so good to me because he, somebody else. Where? He saved me. Yeah, he saved me. That's a pretty good expression of his goodness, don't you think? In the back. All right, I see that hand. Because he does what? He gives you a good night's sleep. He gives you a good night's sleep. Yeah. Amen to that. Do you know? Amen to that. Hello? <laughs> Who wants a good night of sleep? <laughs> Man. I just prayed for somebody just a couple of days ago that God would give them a good night of sleep. That was their prayer request. God, would you pray that God gives me a good night of sleep? That's important if you haven't had a good night of sleep. Amen? All you parents, Bradley... Bradley's been praying that. Bradley and Cassidy, Lord, give us a good night of sleep. Right up there. He fills my, I know he's so good because he fills my heart with joy. Amen to that. Thank you, Jackie. Anybody else? I know God is so good to me because he, anybody else? He takes us through the hard times. I mean, he's there. He does not forsake us. We'll read about that, by the way, in our text this morning. Anybody else? I know God is so good to me because he, he heals us. Yeah, he's a healer God. Well, 
just wanted you to preach a little bit. Take your Bibles this morning, open up the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 12. We'll read our text in just a moment. Now, this month, as you've already heard last week and today, we're talking about reigniting in service through our connection here at uh, RBC. And the Bible has a lot to say about service. And as Chase has already mentioned, if you haven't picked up one of these, I would urge you, they're kiosk uh, located around uh, the campus and pick one of these up. And it'll tell you a lot of ways that you can connect in ministry. Everybody that's saved ought to be doing something for God. Everybody that's saved ought to be doing something for God. And, uh, you know, we're reigniting, we're uh, uh, kind of reopening and reengaging, and it takes a lot of people to do the work of God and the kingdom of God. But God's given us plenty of people. And so the question is for all of us to find that place that God wants us to connect in. Uh, Chase mentioned things like, look, the doors and greeters and welcome. You know, he, he said something, I, I don't know if y'all caught, but it, he's right on, he's spot on. The studies show us that a person generally makes their decision about whether or not they will come back to your church on the first five to ten minutes of their visit. And that's usually because of who they come in contact with first. You know, every preacher wants to think, no, they make their decision based on my great messages. But that's really not the case. In, in either case, great messages or the reason they make a decision. That's usually, it is usually because how they feel, what they sense from people when they walk on the campus. And so there are a lot of ways you say, well, I don't know what I have to offer. Just get started somewhere, connect somewhere, and let us help you and as you begin to move uh, toward that. So that's what we're talking about all through this month. And now we've just honored our moms just a few minutes ago, and, and we thank God for them. We thank God for their sacrifices, and about, uh, we thank God for their hearts. And, and when we're talking about being a servant, would you agree that uh, there's probably no better example of being a servant than a mom. Would you agree with that? I, I mean, I know perhaps you grew up and had a dysfunctional setting or something like that, but by and large, there's nobody that exemplifies service better than, than moms. And that kind of service that is pictured in moms is also the kind of selfless service that we see talked about in the Scripture. When I was preparing the message this week, I came across some statements I want to share with you by some people that, that you'll recognize, at least their name. Rick Warren, for example, pastor at Saddleback Church, said this, Faithful servants never retire. You can retire from your career, but you will never retire from serving God. Charles Spurgeon said one of the greatest rewards, listen to this carefully, one of the greatest rewards that we ever receive for serving God is the reward of the permission to do even more for him. K. Arthur, great uh, women's Bible study uh, teacher, said so many times we, we say that we can't serve God because we aren't whatever is needed. Well, that's what you need. I can't serve because that's not who, what I am. I don't have the talent. I'm not smart enough or whatever. But she goes on to say this, but if you are in covenant with Jesus Christ, if you're in that relationship with him, listen to this, he is responsible for covering your weaknesses, for being your strength. And he will give you his abilities for your disabilities. Isn't that good? And then, how about this? Some of you guys will know this name, George Foreman. You know, he's famous for his grill. No, I, well, uh, and George Foreman said this. Don't let, listen, this is good. Don't let any opportunity lead you away from serving God. And then he says, that's a price that's too high to pay. A.W. Tozer said, how utterly terrible is the current idea that Christians can serve God at their own convenience. Author Randy Alcorn said, it is by serving God and others that we store up heavenly treasures and everyone gains, no one loses. And then Billy Graham said, serve God and live. Serve the other gods and die. We are designed, we're created to serve, and specifically to serve God. It's one of the primary reasons Jesus told a parable called the parable of the talents. Have y'all heard the parable of the talents? Well, if you've been in this church for very long, you have, because I preached it over the last two decades probably four or five times. And the whole message of the parables is to be faithful servants or faithful stewards. And that's why at the end of the parable, Jesus says this. 
He brings two of the stewards or the servants, depending on which translation. The word means to say these, these servants. He brings them to them and he, he commends them because they had done, they had served with what he had entrusted to them. That would be uh, the equivalent of our gifts and abilities. And they had served faithfully and he, at the end. And it's a picture of the day when we stand before God. And they come in and the master says to them, well done, good and faithful servants. But there were three people in the parable. There is one who is considered an unfaithful servant. And when he is called forward to the master, the master says, cast him into outer darkness. Think about that. Well done, good and faithful servants, to two, but to one, uh, he says, you were entrusted, you were entrusted with this responsibility to serve me, and you didn't do it. Cast him into uh, outer darkness. Now, last week, we talked about the prophet Haggai's sermon. Remember that? We talked about the prophet Haggai's sermon uh, to God's people, and it was about serving in the house of God and on the house of God. Well, today, I want to show you another sermon. That's why I've entitled it in your worship folder, Samuel's Sermon, because Samuel also has a similar kind of message to the people of God related to their faithfulness, ongoing faithfulness in service to him. If you're physically able to do so, stand with me uh, this morning as we read our text in chapter 12, 1 Samuel Beginning in verse 19, this is what it says. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God. Now, we'll come back to that. So remember that. Pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die, for we uh, have added to all our sins this evil, to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great namesake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Enlighten our hearts and minds this morning. Help us not just to be hearers of the word but to be doers, just as Samuel was encouraging the people of God then to serve you wholeheartedly and faithfully. Let us walk from this place today with a, a, a fresh commitment, Father, to serve you with our, our whole heart, with all our strength. So speak to us now from your word. We are listening. We are listening. Tell him right now. Say, God, I'm listening. In your heart, you tell him, God, I'm listening to you. Speak to me. And Father, that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And you can be seated. Now, let me kind of let me kind of set this up for you a little bit so you'll understand what we're talking about here. This passage is a passage that is uh, commonly referred to as Samuel's farewell sermon. He's brought all the people of Israel. He's been a man of God. In fact, a prophet of God, just like Haggai. But this is his farewell speech. If you can get that in your mind, this is his farewell sermon. It is the last sermon. It's the last message he's going to share with them. And he calls them together. And by the way, he rebukes them because they had just really rebelled against God. They had sinned. They wanted to be like everybody else. And everybody else had a, a physical king. And so they said, we want to have a physical king too. And uh, the prophet told them, you don't want a physical king. You're not going to like a physical king. You're not going to enjoy a physical one because he's going to tax you. He's going to make laws that you don't like. He's going uh, to impose his will upon you. And you don't really need a king because God Almighty is your king. But they said, we don't care. We want a king like everybody else. And so they sinned in that regard, but God gave them Listen, there's a whole sermon there. God gave them what they asked for, not what they needed. And God gave them a king, and that king would, in time, the kings, many of them would become wicked and impose wicked uh, uh, agendas upon the people of God and persecute their own people and those kinds of things. But he recaps in this message, he recap, and we broke in at the end of his farewell. If you want to read the whole thing, you can go back. Keep your Bible open. I'm going to refer to some things there. But so 
uh, he, he refers to the work of God, kind of what God has done uh, over the course of his life and his ministry. And then he also talks about how, how he has faithfully served God and faithfully served the people of God and that no one could really bring any kind of uh, judgment against him. He even gives them an opportunity. If there's something I've done that you, you need to bring against me, bring it. And they couldn't because he had been a man of integrity. And, uh, and yet he, he rebukes them for this. But in the midst of the rebuke of saying, you rebelled against God, you had to have a king, God didn't want you to have a king, he goes on to say, but God will not forsake his people. And he says, in fact, he says, don't turn from following him and don't turn to follow empty things and then God will be with you. And he, God is pleased to put his name upon you. That's what he says to them. And so he, he essentially gives them a choice. And he says their responsibility is to live in fear of God. It is to obey God and is to serve God. And you know that's always true, isn't it? That hasn't changed. Here we are uh, 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 2,500 plus years later, 3,000 years later, and guess what? Nothing has changed in that. God still expects us to do the same thing. He calls us to live in fear of him, to obey him, and to serve him. And if we do, we reap, we reap something. We reap his presence, that he won't forsake us, and we reap his power. His presence and power go together, and that will be ours. But we can also choose not to do these things. And, and Samuel makes clear, if we choose not to, to live in the fear of the Lord and to obey the Lord and to serve the Lord, that God would sweep them away. Now, all of us make a conscious and an unconscious decision about whether we're going to serve or not serve or who we're going to serve or who we're not going to serve. I remember the late 70s and the early 80s, uh, Bob Dylan, of the famed folk writer, had become uh, uh, well known in the Christian world because he had come out publicly having followed Christ as his Savior. Um, how real that was, we don't know, but at least for several years there was a lot of evidence that seemed to indicate that. And he had this album, and it's still one of my favorites. I have to tell you, it's called Slow Train. And... Um, he had a song on that that became very, very popular across all markets, and it was entitled Serve Somebody. And, and, and just one of the, the lines in there goes, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. It's a pretty lengthy song, and he goes through a lot of verses where he's talking about all the things you have a choice to serve. But he said, in the end, you're going to have to serve somebody. And he always says this, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve someone. Well, his theology is right on there because the fact is there are only two options for you. If you don't serve God, by default, you are serving the devil. You say, oh, I would never serve the devil, but listen to me. By default, if you're not serving God, you're serving the prince and power of this world. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to show you three things that relate to our who we serve and how we serve and what we serve that are, are given to us in this farewell sermon by Samuel. Number one, Samuel's sermon spoke of the identification as servants. Look, pray for your servants. Pray for your servants. They identified themselves. Isn't it interesting they identify themselves as servants? And, ser and by the way, that means servants of the Lord. They identified themselves as servants of the Lord, and it's interesting for them to claim that identity because they had been doing anything but serving the Lord. They had been, they had been in rebellion against God, against the work of God and the will of God. And so it was a self-designated title that uh, had been true in the past, but it wasn't true when, when Samuel had been talking to them. So they're identity. We're, we're, pray for your servants, they said. Servants of the Lord. You're a servant of the Lord. We serve, uh, we serve the Lord. Pray for us that God won't kill us. So they're identifying, self-identifying. This is who we are, and yet it wasn't it wasn't reflected in how they behaved and what they practiced. And there are a couple of lessons there for us, too. There's a lesson, like write this down, that being a servant of God is more than simply belonging. Being a servant of God is more than simply belonging. 
You see, they belong to a group. That group was known as the people of God. It is, he says right here, God was pleased to put his name on people. By the way, that reflects us too. Did you know that? If you're in Christ, you are the people of God. You were grafted in, Paul says, to the people of God. And so uh, the, one of the things we ought to learn from this confession that they make, this identification as servants, is that, that being a servant of God is more than simply belonging. We are servants, you know, we belong to the people uh, of God. And there are many people today who belong to the church, but they're really not connected to the work of God through the church of God. They belong, but they're not connected. And since you're designed to serve God, it's not enough just to belong. Does that make sense? You're designed to serve. God wants you to serve because you belong. Now, in the world we live in, it's such an entertainment-driven age that sometimes, even without knowing, we view the church as a, just another venue in our life that exists to kind of entertain us, uh, to make us feel good, to bring uh, pleasure to us. We view it that way as opposed to the church being the kind of place where we engage in knowing God and as being God's faithful servants. The kingdom of God, you see, is more than just belonging. Y'all got that? Yes. Do like this so I can move on. Y'all yes. got that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Y'all can amen every once in a while too. It's okay. All right. So the kingdom of God is is about more than just belonging, all right? And being a servant of God is more than just belonging. Number two, being a servant of God is more than simply confessing. I'm still under the first point. Being a servant of God is more than simply confessing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I, I'm a, I'm a follower of God. I'm a, a follower of God. Now, listen to what James said in chapter 2 of his letter. He said, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you, listen to this, I will show you my faith by my works. And then he adds this, you believe that God is one, you do well. They had the right confession. But then he adds this, well, even the demons believe and shudder. So you see, it's, it's not just about your confession. See, James said, you can say I'm a person of faith. You can say I'm a person that follows Christ. He said, the confession, though, is demonstrated. Your faith is demonstrated by your actions, by your service, by what you do. He said, the confession is not enough because even the demons believe, but they don't evidence that they are servants of God. And that was the problem of the, the people here in our passage, but it's also our problem, isn't it? That, that there's sometimes... Our confession and our service are, don't line up. Um, they confess to be servants of God, but, but they were not serving the will or the purpose of God. And their lives were self-focused. They weren't God-focused. Look over, look over at verse 12. We didn't read this, but this is part of the narrative. Look at verse 12. It says, And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. And you say, no, what's the point of that? Well, to, to remind you that their lives were self-focused, they weren't God-focused. That statement right there tells us, they said, when you saw Naash come against you and they were led by a king, you said, we want a king like that. We want to be led by a king like that. Why? Their eyes were on themselves. They were self-focused. They weren't God-focused. And so they, while they confessed the right things, the evidence of their life said they were anything but servants of God. So servants of the Lord are not validated by their verbal identification, but by their fruit you will know them. Make sense? All right. So it's not enough to say, oh, yeah, I'm a servant of God. They said that, but they weren't serving God. The second thing I want you to see this morning from Samuel's sermon is he spoke of the dedication of ser uh, servants. Verses 20 and 21, and I'll refer back to those in just a moment. Now, being a true servant of God requires dedication to God, and it requires dedication to the things of God. 
I don't know if you know the name Usain Bolt. He, he won the gold medal in the London Olympics in the 100 meter. He ran 100 meters, set a world record. It may still stand. It probably does. He ran the 100 meters in less than 10 seconds. And it caused him to be identified as the world's fastest human. And sometimes we tend to think, well, wow, he, he achieved that in the race. But the fact is, he became the fastest human being, not because of the race itself, but the race itself was won through long hours of practice and workouts and weightlifting and uh, 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 special dieting and, and coaching. You see, the race was not won in the performance. It was run it was won by the dedication to preparation. There was dedication. There was commitment there. Our, our desire for the greater work of God should cause us to be willing to sacrifice some things. Usain Bolt knew he had to, there were trade-offs he had to make if he was, in fact, going to win those races and become that fast. He understood there was trade-offs. There was practice and there were workouts and all of those kinds of things. But there were trade-offs. And we have to do the same thing as servants of God. We have to look and say, God, there are trade-offs. There are trade-offs, and those trade-offs mean that there may be some things I have to give up, maybe even some good things that I have to give up for the sake of the things that are even better. So how is my dedication to the things of God demonstrated if I'm going to be a faithful servant. How, how do I demonstrate that? Two things that I, we, we get from the passage. First, there must be a passionate commitment. There must be a passionate commitment. We see it again reflected in verse 20 and 24. That phrase, underline this in your Bible, where he talks about serve the Lord with all your heart. Now, uh, notice he says, do not turn aside from following the Lord. That's in verse 20. Do not turn aside. This is the first of two do not turn statements that Samuel makes to them. And this one tells us not to turn away from following God and serving the Lord with all of our heart. He, he said, in other words, it, the, a different way to phrase it would be, make sure you continue to serve God with all of your heart for all of your life. Now, the fact is, we have plenty of half-hearted servants of God. We have plenty of half-hearted servants of God. But God looks inside of us, and he knows whether our service to him is wholehearted or half-hearted. And he looks inside of us. The Bible says he, he sees on the inside. He says man looks on the outside to see uh, uh, who a person is. But God, the Bible says, looks on the inside. He looks at the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. So let me ask you this morning, if you evaluated yourself, don't speak it out loud, but if you were to evaluate yourself, would you say I'm a half-hearted servant of God or a wholehearted servant of God? Or would you say I'm not even a servant of God, period? Paul, listen to what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6. He says, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves or servants of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And listen, and having been set free from sin, have now become servants of righteousness or slaves of righteousness. And the word slave there means a bond servant, and it denotes a person who has, has willingly made themselves a servant. They didn't have to be, but they have willingly bound themselves to their master. It is a, a, they have become a servant by choice. They have a passionate commitment to serve the master. They love the master, and they have, uh, they have made sure that they stayed connected to him. And again, you see the statement in verse 21, do not turn aside from, or, or 20, uh, from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your ha heart. It reflects something. It reflects a choice, doesn't it? I, and I want you to understand something this morning. I want you to understand that serving God with passion begins with a choice. It begins with a choice, not a feeling. You say, but you're talking about serving God with passion. Yes, I know that. But we sometimes think, well, I'll serve God when I feel like it, when I feel more, more like it. Some of you probably got up this morning and said, I don't feel like going to church. But you did. 
And now you're glad you came to church. And you're going to go home. You're going to be glad you, you came and you worship God. You see, you didn't act on your feeling. You acted on what you understood was responsible Christian discipline. And so sometimes what we say is, well, I know I should serve God, but I just don't have the passion for it. I'll, when I get the passion, I'm going, to start, I'm going to start practicing God's work with passion. Well, listen, stop, listen, stop trying to feel yourself into an action. Amen. Amen. Now, I love feelings, and I'm all for feelings. But, man, it's too often feelings warp the right thing. Amen. Stop, listen, stop trying to feel yourself toward an action. I'm going to feel myself toward service for God. Because if you do that, you probably won't make a choice to be a servant. But instead, what should you do? Okay, since you ask. Stop trying to feel yourself to an action and instead start acting yourself toward a feeling. Because I want to tell you something, in time, if you will act yourself toward a feeling, guess what? You'll begin to find out, hey, wow, I really do enjoy doing this for the Lord. I do enjoy serving God. I've acted myself toward a feeling instead of waiting for the feeling uh, to, to come, to, uh, to overtake me. But dedication to servant also involves a priority adjustment. That's the second thing to note it, it, it involves a priority adjustment. It's not just about a passionate commitment. It's about adjusting your priorities. And we see that here reflected in the second do not turn statement. And, and when he says, uh, do not turn to empty things. It's about not getting distracted. It's about not serving the wrong things. You know, a lot of us will end up serving things that we had no intention of serving and not out of malice, not even out of rebellion. But if we don't turn ourselves to the right things, guess what? You will turn yourself to the wrong stuff. I've told you, I've told you for two decades now that nobody has to coach me in how to blow it. Nobody has to teach me how to do the wrong thing. It's instinctive, man. It just... It'll, if, if the Spirit of God doesn't lead me, guess what? The spirit of this world, the powers of the enemy will instead direct me. Come on, Pastor. Now, I want you to understand how important it is then to adjust your priorities. And uh, that's what he's talking about here. I love George Mueller. I, I've told you this for a long time. It, Read a biography on George Mueller. If you have never read a biography on George Mueller, that is your assignment. He's one of the great men of faith. Read, read, read a bio on George Mueller. And George Mueller, uh, God used him incredibly uh, all over the globe. And he was once asked what his secret of, of service and success for God was. And this is his answer. He responded, and I quote, There was a day when I died, utterly died. Died to George Mueller, to George Mueller's opinions, to George Mueller's preferences, to George Mueller's taste, and to George Mueller's will. I died to the world, its approval or its censure. I died to the approval or the blame even of my own brothers and sisters and friends. And since then, I have studied to show myself approved only to God. Did you get what he was saying? They said, what's the secret of your success? And he said, priority adjustment. I died to myself. Well, listen, that's an interesting statement because it lines up with what Jesus said. It lines up with what John the Baptist said. It lines up with what Paul said. Jesus said this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. And follow me. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, he said, he must increase and I must decrease. And Paul in Galatians said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
our priorities. You see, that, that, that's what they were talking about, priorities. Jesus, you want to follow me? There's some, going to be a priority adjustment. John the Baptist said, I have to decrease. He has to increase. Priority adjustment. Paul said, I've been crucified. I've crucified myself with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Priority adjustment, priority adjustment. And our priorities are generally shaped by what we value. That's not all bad. I mean, we value family, we value friends, we value material things, we value God, and we, but your priorities will reveal what the primary, what the primary things that, and values of your life are. Dedicated servants, listen, have learned to evaluate and adjust the priorities of their life in order to elevate the priorities of God. Did you get that? Dedicated servants of God have learned to trade off the priorities of life and understanding what should be. And by the way, there's intersection between those two, okay? There's intersection between the priorities of life and the priorities of the kingdom. So don't get me, me wrong. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all of these priorities of the world, all of these things will be yours. Amen. See? So Jesus understands there's intersection of the priorities of life. The key is what determines the priorities. And I probably ought to say it this way, who determines the priorities? Does that make sense? Yes, yes. And so to be a dedicated servant, we have to understand that. We have to understand the priority thing. We have to be willing to make uh, adjustments to the, to the, uh, in our priorities to intersect with the priorities of God. I read about a group of friends that went deer hunting and they paired off for the day. And that night, as they were all gathering back to the, the lodge, one of the guys, Harry, uh, not Harry, but one of the hunters returned alone, and he had this eight-point deer. He was struggling to get back by himself to the lodge. And when he got back, uh, his friend said, hey, where's Harry? And he said, oh, Harry. He said, he had a stroke. He's laying on the trail back there about two miles. And they said, you didn't bring Harry with you? You, didn't, you? you brought the deer and left Harry laying there? And the guy said, well, he said, I figured nobody would steal Harry. He got his, y'all get that? Or is that a courtesy laugh? Um, he had his priorities a little out of whack, Right? And it's a humorous story, but the fact is our priorities reflect what's really valuable to us. So I ask you, where's God in the list of the things that you value? And do your priorities need to be reevaluated? But there's one last thing I want you to see from Samuel's sermon. He spoke a third, the continuation of servants. Verse 24, he says, only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully. Did you get that? Only fear the Lord, serve him faithfully. And he does, says again, do it with all your heart. He concludes his message by admonishing the people of God to be faithful servants. Think about that. This is how he ends his message. He doesn't just throw this in, and we see the word serve or servant uh, uh, several times in these verses. He doesn't just kind of say, oh, yeah, and by the way, while I'm at it, uh, serve God faithfully with your heart. Now, this is a theme of what he's saying to them. I'm going to be gone. I'm going to pray for you. And uh, who knows what kind of ongoing instruction he might give. But he says, as for you, he said, I want to just admonish you to do something from this point forward because not doing, this, ha, not doing it has gotten you in trouble. So let me just remind you to fear God and serve him with all your heart. Think about it. That's what he wraps up pretty much wraps up his sermon with. And he's encouraging them to be lifetime servants of God. Not seasonal servants, not when it's easy to serve, but to live always as God's servant. And the fact is, our service to God is from now until eternity. From now until eternity. We are to be faithful servants. That's why... why we want to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful steward or servant. See, because we're responsible between now and eternity to live 
as his servant. That's why this whole matter is so important of us serving God while we can serve God. And if you study the New Testament, you see the church was brought into existence in order to reach people by the believers who served God through the auspices of the local church. That's why we talk about it. That's why we do these things, connect and serve, and urge you to find a place. Now, some of you may say, you know, uh, I did my time. God doesn't see it that way. You don't like punch in and punch out. You are a servant, and this is what Samuel said, from the time you come into this world until the time you go out of this world. And so it's not like seasonal, as I said. It's not temporary, but you see yourself as a servant of God. I am a servant of God. And I, that I will be, that's one of the things that I will be accountable for. Did I serve God in that window called my earthly life? And you say, what does that mean? Well, because some of you may be here and say, well, I can't do some of the things I used to do. I, I can't do some of the things. Uh, this is a younger audience, but there are some of us in this place that understand what that means, that I can't do some of the things that I used to do. My brain, I still try to do some things, and my brain tells me I can do it. My body says no. And the way I know that is after I have done these things or attempted to do these things, my body screams at me, and it screams, Tylenol, <laughs> Tylenol. But I want to tell you so. But, but what you don't do is you don't say, well, I can't do what I used to do. That may be true of you. It may be true of all of us. I can't do some of the things I used to do. That's not the question. The question is, are you doing what you can do for God right now? We sing, Bradley knows I love this song, My Testimony. We sing that song in here. Y'all know that song, My Testimony. The most powerful line in the whole thing, it is, man, God has used it in my life over the last year. If, if you're not dead, God's not done. Amen. If you're not dead, God's not done. Amen. And so the question is not, well, what I used to do. The question is, are you doing? Are you serving at all? Because we're called to, to continue uh, until Christ either calls us home or he returns. He's called us to continue to serve faithfully. And there are two, at least two, good reasons that Samuel gives us here. And this is what I close with. First of all, he, he ta- there's a fearful motivation. There's a fearful motivation. Um, now, I refer you back to last week's message. If you weren't here or you didn't hear last week's message, I, I would encourage you to go, uh, go, go and listen to that. Go online or listen on the podcast or whatever it may be. Go listen to that message because I talk significantly and substantively about something I think we've forgotten, and that is the fear of God. I don't think there's much fear of God anymore. And isn't it interesting, last week when we read the sermon of Uh, the prophet Haggai, he talked to the people about fearing God and then serving in the house of God. Samuel does the same thing, doesn't he? Look at verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him. This is a, a motivation, isn't it? Now, you say, well, I want to serve God out of love. Okay, I, yes. But if you can't get there, you ought to at least say, but I'm also afraid because this is pointing to something. Why do we serve the Lord out of fear? Not so we live like this, but out of an understanding. One day we're going to stand before him. And so we don't have to live like trembling unless we need to tremble. But we say, you know what? I want to be so faithful that I, I'm... I, I know who God is, and one day when I stand before him, I want, to be, I, want to hear that, I want to hear that statement, well done, Ray, good and faithful. And so sometimes what I need is a little healthy fear of God that we've lost today. And part of that is because we see God as existing for us instead of us existing for God. Did you know the Bible says you were created, listen to this, you were created for his pleasure in Revelation. You were created for his pleasure. He wasn't created for ours. 
He doesn't exist for our pleasure, though he may bring it. And by the way, what I found is when I serve him, I find the pleasure of God because he's designed me for that. But there's this fearful motivation. The day's going to come when we're going to give an account of our service. And by the way, nobody likes to say that really today. Even in our pulpits, nobody likes to say, you probably need to be a little more frightened of God than you are. Nobody wants to say that, right? Because it doesn't reach out to a a millennial audience or the next uh, generational audience. They don't like that stuff, we're told. I don't think that's true of ours. But the fact is, it's the uncomfortable part. Uh, You know, when you say, look, you need a healthy uh, fear of God Um, because you're going to stand before him one day. John Kenneth Galbraith was a politician, a diplomat, and an economist, and very well known in his era for a number of decades. And Galbraith uh, served under President Lyndon Johnson. And in his biography, a, a Life in Our Time, he talks, about, he talks about his housekeeper. Her name was Emily and how, how good she was at her job and what she did. And on one particular day, he talks about in his uh, autobiography, he says, I came home, I was, so, I was just so weary uh, from the day. And I asked uh, Emily, the housekeeper, if she would hold all of my telephone calls uh, and allow me to take a nap. So I didn't want to take any calls, he said. But shortly after uh, he had laid down, fallen asleep, the phone rang. And it was the president, Lyndon Johnson, who was calling from the White House. And when she answered, immediately the president said, get me Ken Galbraith. This is the president. And Emily, the housekeeper, responds back. I love this. She said, Mr. President, he's sleeping. And he told me not to disturb him. The president says, well, wake him up. I'm the president. Wake him up, and I need to talk to him. To which Emily replied back and said, no, sir, Mr. President. I don't work for you. I work for him. (laughs) Isn't that great? Well, he says, Ken Galbraith, he says, when I called the president back after I had awakened, the president could scarcely control his pleasure. He said, Ken... I don't know who that woman is, but you tell her that I want her to work here in the White House. (laughs) You know, sometimes who we serve is, is motivated by a certain kind of fear and sober thinking, isn't it? We serve God because we think, I don't work for the world, I work for God. I, I, don't, I don't take the, the road of the world. I follow the, the counsel of God. But there's a second reason he gives us to continue faithfully as his servants, and that is what I call grateful consideration. Did you notice at the end of verse 24? Look there for a second. For consider what great things he, that's God, has done for you. Consider what great things he has done for you. This means it's good to recall the great things he has done for you. It's why I kind of started this message off with, you know, God has been good to me because. What does it do? It causes us to think, well, how has God been good to me? Here's a way God's been good to me. Here's a way that God has been good to me. And that's exactly what Samuel says to the people. He said, recall all the good things that he has done for you. And when you do that, how can you not serve him? When you recall that he died for you, that he gave his life for you, that that in doing so, he has given meaning and purpose to your existence. You know one of the greatest questions that is always asked, still asked today by people that don't know Christ is, why am I here? How did I get here? What what is my life about? Well, listen, he gives meaning to our existence. He's given you heaven. He's preserved you. He's protected you. He's provided for you. He's loved you unconditionally. He's brought you through when you didn't know how you were going to make it, hasn't he? How can you not gratefully serve him and worship him when you consider all that he's done for you? 
in Romans chapter 12, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. You only say, present yourself sacrificially as a servant to God. God, here I am. Use me how you wish to use me. The great violinist Niccolo Paganini took his most famous violin and he gave it to the city of Genoa. But he had a condition when he gave this great violin that he had played so incredibly. He had this condition. The condition was this, that I'll give this to the city to put in a showcase, but it is to never be played again by anyone save only me if I should want to. It's only for display. Nobody else is to ever touch it. Nobody else is to ever play it. Now, the wood that the instrument was made out of while it's used and it's handled, has very little decay on it. I mean, there's light. It, it just doesn't affect it too much by playing on it. But here's the deal. If it's not handled and it's not played, you know what happens to that wood over time? It decays. And today, Paganini's incredible violin, you know what it is? It's a worm-eaten, decayed, useless relic. That's what it is. It's, at one point in time, it had been played by the master, and it was so incredible. But over time, because it wasn't played, it became completely useless. Y'all understand where I'm going with that? Why is serving God so important? It is because you were created for the purpose of serving God. That violin was created to be played, not to be viewed. You have been created by the master craftsman, and you are called to God to serve and a Christian, if they are unwilling to serve, will in time decay and destroy their own capacity for use, usefulness. You see, God created you to be a servant. And, and when he created you to be a servant, he sent his son to die for you. And when you responded to his son as your savior, he gave you a gift. And that gift was called the indwelling Holy Spirit. And the indwelling Holy Spirit came to preside, not just reside in your life, something to be viewed, but to preside in your life in order to enable you to be useful for God. Do you know what? You're like the violin created for the master's use, and the Spirit of God is the music that God uses inside of you to serve the purposes of the kingdom. And if you're not serving you become useless in the work of God. You say, now, Pastor, are you talking about like serving like you do or Brother Chuck or Bradley or some of these staff members? Only if God calls you to do that. That's a unique kind of calling. But you are, to be a, uh, you are to serve him in the church, find places and ways in the church, the body of Christ. And then when you walk out of this place, you're to see yourself as his servant. Whatever you do, wherever you are, whatever vocation you have, you're a servant there. You're a servant here. But God has designed you to serve. And to do anything less will eventually render you useless for the master. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? No one looking about in this place. Before we're gone, maybe in this place today, you say, I, I've never given my life to Christ. Look, you, you can't be used by him if you don't have a relationship with him. And you can change all that. Those of you who are joining us by live stream in this live audience, you can call out to him. You can put your trust in Christ today. You can say something like this in your heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying for me. And thank you uh, that you love me. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I need you. And I want to be a part of your family. And I want to be your servant. And so I invite you to come into my life. I receive you as my Savior and Master and Lord. You created me for service, and I want to serve you. 
You may be in this place this morning and say, you know what, I, I know him, but I haven't been serving him. Why don't you just tell him, Lord, forgive me for not serving. And God, I'll not wait on my feelings to catch up with my faith. I'll not wait on my feelings to move me to an action. I'll begin acting. I'll begin serving. I'll find a way. I'll find a place in the work of the church to serve you, God. Thank you for creating me and giving me. That's part of my purpose. I realize that. You may be here this morning and say, you know what, I just need a church family. Already today, people have joined us and become a part of our family. Maybe today is the day that you need to do the very same. With heads bowed and eyes closed, in just a moment, I'm going to step down here to the front. Yes, the altar is open. I invite you to come and pray around this altar. Use it. Take advantage of it. It's been so long since we've been able to come and kneel. It is open. I'll be here at the front. Staff members will be uh, near the aisles. And if you won't come to any of us and just say, here's a decision. I've prayed to trust Christ today. Or come and say, I'd like to join Ridgecrest, or I need to be baptized, and we'll schedule all of that. But I want to invite you, balcony, ground floor, to slip out from where you're seated. Either come to pray or come and say, Pastor, here's a decision. Staff member, here's a decision today that I am making. Father, would you use this time for us, we pray. In Jesus' name, would you stand with with us as as the band plays? I invite you to make your way to the front, to the altar, to make your decision, whatever it is. You come on right now. Slip out. Come on. Hey, everyone, and welcome back again to this time where we want to focus in on responding and saying yes to whatever it is that Jesus is calling us to do. Maybe today, as our pastor has walked through this time of invitation, you feel that you're at a place where you need to make the decision to follow Christ You've never accepted Jesus and made him your Lord and your master, or possibly you have questions about that. Let us know that. We'd love to follow up with you. We'd love for you to let us know what's going on so that we can um, comment and and just uh, answer any questions you may have, but also celebrate what God is doing in your life. Let us know that by texting the word pastor to 334-384-8080. And again, someone will follow up with you very soon about that. Also today, maybe a way you feel God calling you to be obedient and respond is through joining our church. If you're interested in joining us here at Ridgecrest or have more questions about that, you can text the word join to the same number that's already been mentioned and the number that's on the screen. And we'll follow up with you as well and help you know personally or you and your family know how you can become a part of our Ridgecrest family. Then also today, maybe you feel God, as our pastor has has taught us through God's word today about this thought of serving. Maybe you're at that place where you're like, I want to serve. I need a place. And there's a place for you. Text the word serve to 334-384-8080. And then lastly, if you're a guest of ours today, man, it was an honor to have you a part of this worship. If you were uh, just tuning in and you're a guest of ours, we'd love to hear from you. And you can text the word guest to the same number that's already been mentioned. Maybe a text message is not the best for you as far as response. You can always email us at decision at rbcdothan.org. What a special day it has been as we've celebrated our moms and we've been able to highlight them. Also, though, more importantly, we've highlighted and worshiped Jesus together. The song Promises was a special one as we again think about the anchor that Jesus is to us and how it's firm and held to the ground. Also, this message from our pastor as we think about Samuel's sermon, looking at what it looks like to serve. And I love what our pastor said towards the end. He said, a Christian's unwillingness to serve God will impact a Christian's usefulness for God. You and I have the opportunity to be useful for the glory and honor of our great God. And that comes through our service for his honor and his glory. We'd love for you to, again, to be thinking through about ways that you can serve. And all of us have the opportunity to serve on our church campus and we can serve where God's placed us and where we live every single day. So we encourage you this week, again, pick up one of these from our our church if you haven't done so already. Flip through it, look through ways, pray and ask God, what is it that you'd have me to do for your honor and your glory here at Ridgecrest as we think about fulfilling the mission that God's called us to. A few things as we wrap up together today, as we get closer um, to just uh, what God is doing throughout the summer here at Ridgecrest, I want to remind you that we'll be having Vacation Bible School coming up this June. Please go on our website, check out those details. We'll have a one family worship the first Sunday night of June. We're looking forward to being united back together in that context. 
Also, we have uh, Love Your Neighborhood coming up in May, May 22nd. We are looking forward to that time together as we serve the area right here around our church. And we just want to remind you also to check out RBC3, and it has more details of all that's happening in our church. And then as you think about social media and our YouTube channel and our podcast platforms, please always check those things out. Like, share, subscribe, things like that. That helps us to engage more people with the things that we're seeking to put out there to encourage folks to follow Jesus every single day of their life. As we wrap our time together up today, we're thankful again for just the faithfulness of our God, but also the faithfulness of our church and giving. And a reminder today that you can give by texting the amount that you'd like to give to 334-408-4112. You can go to the website, click the Give tab, or you can always drop your tithes and offerings by the church as well, and we can receive them that way. And again, thank you so much. It allows us to continue the mission that God has given us to fulfill. And that mission we say around here at Ridgecrest is simply this, to reach the lost, build the believer, and connect the people of God to the mission and purpose of God. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. Happy Mother's Day.